Working Cows Podcast, Episode 132. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast here for an episode with you guys. Yes, uh, we are not canceling podcast episodes, so we're going to keep on producing content and, uh, and might even get some bonus content out here in the near future. Um, probably won't be until the first part of April when we get some of that bonus content out, uh, but there will be some some Patreon bonus content too. So if you're feeling locked away and in need of some some new content to consume, I'd encourage you to head over on over to patreon.com slash working cows and you can sign up there for some fresh bonus content that's coming out. I've got 10 or 11 episodes up there now of bonus content and there'll be some some new stuff coming here in the very near future uh, that direction. But today we're going to talk to uh, Cody Spencer. He is managing Rome Ranch uh, down in Texas got a unique perspective as a guy who grew up in Alberta and has a lot of familiar familiarity with that part of the world and is also kind of getting uh, a regenerative bison ranch off the ground there in uh, Texas as well. So looking forward to uh, picking Cody's brain a little bit about some of the different things they've got going on in the different uh, operations that he is a part of and that he is familiar with. So Cody, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Thanks for having me, Clay. You are uh, on a piece of land that has been in need of some rehabilitation. Uh, what are what are what tools are you using for uh, that rehabilitation of that land? So, Clay, we've got uh, a mix of land type covers here on Rome Ranch. We've got we've got fields and paddocks anywhere from cropland that has been tilled and tilled and sprayed to death over the last 150 years to native rangeland that is still in relatively decent condition. We've got, um, you know, in some of our better soils in our riparian areas, we still have some of those good tall grass species that we're looking for, like Indian grass, big blue stem, switchgrass, and even a few eastern, eastern gamma plants. So, and, and everything in between, tame pastures, um, you name it, but the kind of common thread is that they've been degraded um, over the last 150 years due to management. And um, so what we're trying to do with our bison herd is practice adaptive multi-paddock grazing, holistic land grazing, whatever you want to call it, um, in conjunction with planting cover crops on, on the fields that that need it, specifically those really degraded farmlands. And just trying to get that get that biology going in the soil through living roots. Um, this area has huge potential uh, to be highly productive, but we've stripped that down. You know, the soils here historically would have been around seven eight percent organic matter. In some of our worst fields, we're dealing with less than half a percent of organic mm-hmm. matter. So that tells you how far how far back we've, how far down we've driven our system. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, could we talk a little bit about some of the unique abilities of bison as well as some of the challenges that they present? Absolutely. Um, So bison, I'm just going to start off by saying that bison uh, absolutely have their place in a regenerative system. Um, There's not very many people that are utilizing bison to actively restore soils Uh, but there are you know there are a handful of people throughout north america that are highly successful in utilizing bison and you know they're they're close enough to cattle that a lot of people talk about cattle being that analog to mimic the bison herds to restore landscapes and what we're doing is we're trying to mimic the bison historic grazing patterns just with bison (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, that that's got its that poses challenges because, you know, obviously the way 
that land use has evolved over the last 150 years, we've parceled everything up and, you know, bison can't roam like they, they used to be able to. So we've got to do that ourselves with, you know, the use of fencing or herding or, or whatever that might be. And so um, our management looks pretty similar to, you know, how you'd manage a cattle herd uh, to regenerate land. You know, we try to, we try to get as many paddocks as we can and try to up the density um, you know, the stock density to meet specific goals in specific paddocks. And, um, you've had Roland Cruz on a couple of times and he's a mentor of mine who works with some of the top bison ranches and, and cattle ranches in the nation. And I think he had said on this show, he did some research trying to piece together historic grazing patterns of bison and, uh, came up with a number of 25 to 30,000 pounds per acre that mm-hmm. bison herds used to run in. And so for us, that's kind of, that's a really good goal um, for stock density. Now we can't get to the point that some of these extreme mob grazers are doing, say with five hundred thousand to a million pounds of stock density per acre. Bison are still wild. They're, mm. you know, we need to treat them as such. We're not looking to change, you know, or completely domesticate these animals and turn them into something they're not. You know, so they we we when we graze our bison, if we are trying to hit those higher stock densities in our paddocks and say, you know, 30,000 pounds per acre plus, um, I use a lot of tactics like strip grazing where we say we move them into a, into a bigger uh, size paddock, say for our herd, we would be about, you know, a good size would be say 10 acres. And then every day just exposing say one acre more. And so they, they will, Mm -hmm. You know, when you do that move, they thrive on that type of a system where you're moving them every day or several times a day. So when you expose that new paddock, they'll, you know, they'll flock to that new piece of grass and without feeling the pressure of being contained in a, in a super small one acre paddock. And, you know, we do that from time to time too, but I, I really like the strip grazing method with bison just because of that, you know, they, they have a flight zone that is much bigger than cattle. Right. And so pressuring them can get a little bit tense if you're trying to put them in, you know, say a half acre paddock or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. I I can actually speak from experience. Uh, last Wednesday morning, I got the opportunity to help, um, load about 300 pair of bison out of a a chute and they were being shipped from here in Western South Dakota to, uh, Southeastern Idaho and so we had we had to catch every calf and, and vaccinate them, and then all the cows had to just go through the chute, and the bulls had to go through the chute. <laughs> the calves were staying in the in the here in western South Dakota for weaning and and some time, and then uh, the the cows were going on, like I said, to southeastern Idaho. And I constantly found myself uh, walking behind somebody who knew what they were doing with bison, and thinking that we were about to enter the flight zone. And by the time I had that thought finished in my head, the person that was in front of me was backing up into me because they knew that their flight zone was bigger than I did. And, uh, it was a, it was a learning experience. I've worked sheep, I've worked cows, and this was unlike anything I'd ever done. Uh, you gotta have your head on a swivel, at least in, in my, and your running shoes laced up, at least in my experience. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, Handling is is similar similar principles uh, to handling cattle, but yeah, like everything is kind of amplified with bison. So that flight zone and the speed and the speed in which they'll load up into a trailer, all of those things are just a little bit. You know, it can catch catch somebody new off guard, but um, they're they're fun animals to work with, and you just it takes a little experience. And cause there is a lot of misconceptions out there about bison, and you know yep. that they're completely crazy and wild and in in the certain situations that is true but we we can avoid those situations with proper management and handling yeah and i i had really good mentors these people have been around bison for a long time and so i just sat there all morning and peppered people with questions about what what's the same what's different and one of the best ways that it was described to me is that uh working bison is like working with sloshing water in a bucket if it's sloshing the way you want it to go you can push it a little bit farther and faster wow. but 
if it's sloshing the way you don't want it to go, just get out of the way and let them come back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I've never heard that analogy. That's perfect, though. I love that. Yeah. So anyways, uh, back to the kind of instincts of the bison herd. Do they graze in a way that is enough different than a cow that it, it is presenting some uh, advantages and challenges of its own? Yeah, certainly on on larger landscapes where you're you're not dealing with you know such a higher in, high intensity management like we're doing on Rome Ranch, there's a lot of advantages to having bison. Um, so you know in in a lot of instances when you've got big pastures and limited watering points, uh, bison tend to and this is pretty well documented and and it does make sense that they'll they'll range further away from water points than cattle will so you know if you got a big pasture and and you've only got that one water source they don't tend to linger at water like cattle do so that you know that just is due to the fact that they still have that that instinct that you know being at water is in they're one of their more vulnerable hmm. you know points and that feeling so they they tend to drink and get out again and they they will, you know, head miles away from their, their water source. Um, you know, with that being said, they're not perfect. They will absolutely still, they will still overgraze. And you, you hear a lot of talk with some people that are, um, don't really have any experience in, in managing land or rangeland. Talk about bison as if there's some sort of a unicorn animal. And if you put them on a landscape, then automatically, it will regenerate that land. And that that's not true. That's simply not true. There's been plenty of experience experiences from people that have thought that. Um, I know Ted Turner had that mindset when he first got bison and bought the Flying D Ranch near Bozeman and 113,000 acres and tore out all the interior fencing mm-hmm. with this, you know, this idea that it would now return itself to this pristine condition and so you still have a lot, like a lot of those things, if you're in a tight valley, you know, they're going to spend more time at those riparian areas and um, spend less time grazing up on the hillsides. But, you know, they, they do a little bit better job than cattle in that type of a scenario. Sure. Yeah. And I guess that that uh, idea that that they're kind of a unicorn animal, um, I mean, back when there were no fences and there they were being grouped tightly by predators and they were being moved off of landscapes by the fouling effect. Their range, if I'm not mistaken, was like huge. I mean, up into Canada, down to Tennessee, down to Texas. I mean, it was a, a massive range. And so thinking that you're going to be able to piece together, you know, a hundred thousand to 3 million acres and, and just take out the fences and they're going to go back to doing that same thing, I think is a bit naive. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, like you say, their, their range, one particular herd could have ranged thousands of miles across the continent and not return for two, three years at a time. And so that, you know, that discussion for me is one of the more interesting conversations around, you know, like we've got the American Prairie Reserve uh, talking, talking about doing, you say, 3 million acres, that's their three or 4 million acres is their goal to run bison um, within still a fenced boundary. And the, I guess the big question is if they ever do get to that level is 4 million acres enough to replicate that historic grazing pattern. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I've got my reservation doubts about that, but I, you know, I would love to see, I would love to see, um, how it turns out, you know, just as, just from, uh, you know, trying to replicate what we, what we used to have. Like, I think, I think there is potential there, but at the same time, we've seen a lot of examples where we thought that was going to work, but it just, you know, trying to manage for an optimal level of range health and grassland health, they still do return to those spots. They know where they, they grazed, you know, that patch of grass that's now got that lush, new green growth and then we'll go back to that spot and so um it all depends on context like everything else if that's what you're managing for and that's what you prefer you're not looking for uh optimal range health and optimal productivity like some of us are in the in the ranching world 
then, you know, that might fit your context more than say somebody like me, um, with our, say our home, our home ranching operation in Alberta, you know, we need to, we need to maximize landscape health and grass productivity, range productivity on that particular piece of land to make a living. So like everything else, it's all about context. Sure. And you mentioned Alberta. You are, as I understand it, an Alberta native now ranching in Texas. And I guess that provides, I would say, a bit of a unique perspective uh, of the phenotypical differences from Alberta to Texas between bison herds. Have you noticed anything or is that, are they, are they just that adaptable? <laughs> well, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so bison are native you know, like yeah, you think you had suggested uh, all the way up into Canada, all the way down the East Coast and through Texas, through all of Texas and into the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico. So they are absolutely native to pretty much most of North America. And um, our bison herds back home and where you're from in South Dakota, you know, we require a larger, bigger animal with more body mass, you know, say 1800 pound bull 2000 pound bull and a thousand pound cow Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that that's what they you know that's the kind of body mass we require for them to uh, to weather those winters those tough winters and there isn't it you know it doesn't get cold enough anywhere to affect a bison like they love it they (laughs) they thrive in those northern climates Uh, it's pretty remarkable but what we see in texas is that you know, we need a smaller animal that has the ability to to shed heat better because that's, you know, that's one of our biggest limiting factors here is just that, you know, that heat is a little bit harder on the bison than those cold temperatures. So, so this, the Southern Plains bison would have been naturally a little bit smaller, uh, been able to handle those conditions a little bit better. And so, you know, some of our bison here, at Rome Ranch came from Wyoming, came from north northeast Wyoming. Some came from the Tallgrass Prairie Reserve in Oklahoma. And so, you know, a little bit north of here. And so we noticed that it took them it took them a, a good year to to really I don't I don't want to say they're adapted now because it's probably a generational thing where, you know, it might mm. take a few generations of of calving in this climate to really dial in on what bison works here in texas and there are you know there are other ranchers here in texas that have been raising bison for much longer than than we have that have kind of developed that uh that genetic base and so to me it's pretty interesting but um yeah when it's all said and done you can't it's much tougher to to bring an animal from the northwest all the way down to the south than it is vice versa and you mentioned earlier on in this episode that you guys are taking a multi-pronged approach with uh, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, uh, cover crops, and and some of those other things to regenerate these soils. Uh, what role does cover crops play? Where are you putting it into use? Um, how are you harvesting those cover cover crops uh, and some of those things? So here in Texas, we've got this remarkable growing season <laughs> coupled with the 28 inches of annual precip you know it's something we just don't have up north um in southern alberta where i'm where i'm from we you know it's a 13 inch ra- rainfall or precip on a good year um short short growing season you know 100 day frost free period whereas we can pretty much grow grass year round in texas here so tons and tons of opportunity to uh, restore these soils and you know speed up that process with cover crops and so what we're doing uh, is we're utilizing that those two distinct growing seasons the cool season and warm season and for about two years now we've been planning cool seasons warm seasons and grazing them high density with our bison herd and so what that looks like is we'll see to cool season in say October and get pretty, pretty solid growth this year all the way through We're you know, we're well into the, the end of February and we're, you know, we've only been, had a few freezes this year and nothing that really set our cool season cover crops back. So just this incredible opportunity, right. 
Hmm. And in Texas, and most of the Southern Plains is dominated by warm season plants. And so, you know, what we're really lacking in our systems is those cool seasons. And, you know, this, the cool season, growing season down here is incredible. So, you know, October all the way through May, you've got this amazing opportunity to grow these, Hmm. uh, you know, nutrient dense crops that aren't, aren't as naturally prevalent in the system. So, you know, standard crops like cereal, rye, hairy vetch, triticale, uh, clovers, um, some medics, you know, not, nothing too crazy on that front um, as far as species goes. And so, for instance, our cover crop that we planted in, in October, we recently, you know, it, it's now up around boot height and we've grazed it once and we'll probably get one or two more grazings out of that before we more or less terminate it with our last grazing period maybe graze it a little bit harder Hmm. and then in goes our warm season so and keep in mind i'm talking more in the context of these croplands these really degraded croplands that we're trying to bring back to perennial pasture eventually now in some of our our tame pastures or so-called improved pastures which here in texas might be there's a lot of bermuda grass Hmm. a lot of klein grass some of these monocultures that you know just do not promote a diverse soil microbial population so we need to you know we need to build up say the organic matter get the biology going in those so we're interceding um, a lot of focusing on cool seasons in those particular so uh, bermuda grass and say klein grass are warm season grasses and you know they 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 thrive pretty well like they will they like being in a monoculture and so hmm. we haven't really uh, seeded warm season covers into those, but we probably will in the future. But we found huge success with introducing some diversity in those cool seasons. You know, that provides grazing on those paddocks year round, hopefully speeding up that regeneration process of those. Yeah. And uh, what what are you, I guess, what was the history of the management on those, on the cropland? Was it, what what kind of crops were in there and... and some of that so they were growing a lot of crops like uh peanuts uh milo uh milo being like a grain sorghum plant Mm -hmm. uh some wheat um you know this this region is not it's not a it's not a a cropping region you know it's not really it's mostly rangeland and so um some of the better soils pockets of soils would have been i guess highly coveted for farming so they you know they would have probably started farming those in a lot of, a lot of them 100 plus years ago and so a lot of heavy heavy tillage to grow those crops and you know chemicals for the last probably 50 years and so we're dealing in with a highly highly degraded system and um you know to get anything to grow for the first couple of years was a real challenge or the, for the first year in particular just because we decided to go cold turkey and uh, not apply any synthetics on those fields. And maybe we would have been better off applying a little synthetic and not just going cold turkey, kind of weaning off of that, getting some biomass up and some, some root structure in the ground. Um, so, you know, the first year in a bit, we, we, you know, we didn't have great success in those fields. And, but now we're starting to see, better results after a year or two and you know you can our soil uh, test came back recently and after two years of that we've uh, increased the organic matter from less than half a percent to a 0.8 of a percent on those fields so it's still incredibly low but that's basically a hundred percent increase in organic matter um, which we're counting as a win so <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Going to hold on to more rain. Every, every little increase helps. Absolutely. Uh, so what's the history of Rome Ranch? You're kind of seem to be indicating uh, a fairly recent timeline with a lot of these different uh, things, the cover crops, the bringing in the bison, uh, all of it kind of sounds like it hasn't been terribly long in the making. Uh, what, what's been some of the, uh, what's been some of the history of of rome ranch yeah so 
the owners of the ranch, Katie Forrest and Taylor Collins, they started a company called Epic Provisions. And basically they built that company on the on the backs of promoting regenerative agriculture, getting regenerative meat out into the mainstream. And they sold that company to General Mills in 2016. And in that process of building that company, they, uh, you know, they built this network of regenerative ranchers throughout the U.S. You know, people the likes of Will Harris, um, some very amazing producers here in Central Texas, and they became inspired by those people and wanted to, you know, we wanted to try their hand at it themselves, and so they purchased Rome Ranch in 2017. So pretty recent. We're only coming up on three years of this ranch being purchased, and set out to apply a lot of these principles of holistic management and you know principles of soil health and take this really degraded piece of land and, and see what we can do to to a regenerate it turn it into a profitable viable agricultural operation and a big part of what we do is educating you know consumers other producers um collaborating and and trying to trying to share as much knowledge as we can to you know to get get these stewardship tactics out to people who want to use them on the land. So we, you know, we host a lot of tours. We uh, host soil soil health workshops, grazing workshops. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of conservation groups here in Central Texas. And so the mission is, you know, is to expand that community of regenerative agriculture and and yeah, just try to because one of the biggest challenges we have is you know the practices they seem to be out there uh you know there's nothing that we're doing is stuff that we've invented you know we're just uh carrying on on the backs of the giants that came before us you know the people like gabe brown the people like uh nicole masters the will harris's of the world we're not inventing anything new here we're just trying to expand that community and help as many people and and acres as possible so Absolutely. Sounds, sounds great. And, uh, going forward, uh, the, you are currently operating a, a commodity herd. Is that correct? Or are you direct marketing some of that or how, how are you guys handling the the herd there? Yeah. So we're, uh, currently we've still got a pretty young herd. Most of the bison here at Rome ranch, uh, showed up as yearling heifers in 2017 and so bison don't actually breed until they're two and a half instead of uh instead of a year and a half as right. with most cattle so uh only this past year did we have our first round of calves and this year will be our second and we're looking to grow as we expand the carrying capacity of the ranch we want you know we we starting to realize that we need more animals we need that bigger herd size we need that animal impact. And so we're going to grow the herd with, from within. And so within, I guess, two years from now, we'll start to see a bit of a volume of grass finished bison. And um, what we won't do is sell them into the commodity market. Uh, grass fed bison is too rare of a, of a product to, you know, unload at commodity prices. And, you know, we have the ability to market those here off the ranch and you know we've got good markets we're near austin and san antonio um, which are both big centers with a lot of people that are that are interested in in local food regenerative food that's only growing and you know as we build our community out we'll have a kind of a marketing outlet for our products here off the ranch so um same thing same thing in alberta we just there's just not enough people that are raising grass-fed bison and so we just see such an opportunity to you know most bison most people don't realize are finished in feedlots over 90 plus percent and Mm -hmm. so for us it's it's an incredible opportunity to differentiate yourself um in that market you know not not be reliant on on that commodity market we've seen this year the price of bison actually drop after uh, soaring to almost all time highs. And, mm. you know, it's, it's just another, uh, you know, people think that they might, 
you know, they thought that, you know, bison would keep rising and stay at a plateau forever. And it's just a, hmm. another reality check that it kind of <laughs> brings you back down. And uh, you can't really get uh, too comfortable with, say, $5 a pound calf prices um, <laughs> and stuff like that, right? So you need to d- differentiate yourself. You need to take control of your own market and capture as much of that dollar as you can. And and by direct marketing, I've found that that's, that's a good way to... Uh, to kind of smooth out those, those ups and downs and, and we enjoy it as well. Sure. So it's quite a bit different animal. Uh, can you walk me through the life cycle of, uh, bison at Rome ranch? Um, when are they born? Uh, where do the, where do the bulls go? Where do the heifers go? Um, kind of, kind of walk me through that if you can. Yeah. So when I first came down here, uh, I lat or two years ago, I was operating in a paradigm, a northern paradigm of, you know, our bison calves right in in tune with the spring green up. So they'll start late April, uh, although May is kind of our big calving season and then kind of trails off in June. Now, coming down here, I thought, okay, well, we, you know, following that logic, it, it greens up quicker down here earlier. Therefore, our animals will start calving earlier. And so keep in mind, we keep the bulls in the herd year round. Mm -hmm. And so this might have been a function of just them being a new herd, heifers, uh, new surroundings, uh, getting acclimated. But we didn't start to see calves until in any sort of a number until June of last year. And so that that was that's been one of our biggest challenges because we're trying to figure out why and if we can influence them to actually start calving earlier, because here in Texas, you know, you calve in June and then you start to get into July and August, which are, I mean, I got to say that it is brutal. It is Mm -hmm. brutal. So you've got these, you know, you've got these young calves out, especially on some of those soils that are a little bit more bare degraded. The heat is just intense and it's not ideal for our, for our herd. And so that's one of the things we're looking to try to influence and, you know, get an older, you know, try to get an older calf coming into July and August. Um, and so once those calves are born, they go through there, we leave them on as calves. We don't wean them. Uh, they'll run in the herd as yearlings. And by the time, generally by the time they're, like I said, two and a half, those heifers, if we leave those heifers on in the herd, um, They'll either, they'll either breed up as a two and a half year old, or if they're open, that is a, that's an excellent grass finished, uh, bison heifer that can command a high price. Um, the bulls generally in, in my systems are more of a wild card. You know, they can be, they can be left in the herd and there's a lot of bison ranches that'll leave them into the herd until leave them in the herd until they're, you know, two and a half, three years old, uh, essentially a grass finished bull um you know those for me are they can you know the yearling uh two-year-old three-year-old bulls can sometimes cause some problems just as far as they're a little bit more rambunctious and they're you know they you know they can be a little rebellious at times but (laughs) generally the mature bulls will keep them in check and so you know what we're trying to accomplish here is not breaking up that societal structure of the bison herd because that in and of itself has got benefits that I don't think we, we even realize. And, you know, if we, if we're separating those calves off every year and shipping them out, that has real impacts on, on those animals. Like we talked about everything being a little bit more amplified with bison. Mm. Um, in my experience, when we have done that, we've weaned calves say in uh, November through uh, February or whatever, it's really hard on that, on those cows. And, um, I'm not sure exactly how to quantify it. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but so there's ranches out there like wild idea, Buffalo company out, out in your neck of the woods mm-hmm. that, uh, really stand by that, that idea of keeping that herd together. And, you know, the, they don't, they definitely don't, uh, see any negative benefits or negative uh, consequences from keeping those bulls in there until they're two or three finished animals. And so something that we're working towards, you know, and, and in that scenario, then you've kind of got a built in drought reserve or drought plan where 
say if you've you got a really bad drought and you know you have either a two-year-old yearling bulls in particular those are pretty liquid animals and you could peel them out of the herd and drop your numbers fairly easily as a as opposed to having just a pure cow calf operation and you're stocked right up to the gills and mm. here comes a drought yep. you know you got to get rid of a bunch of your breeding stock so um, to me that model makes sense and that's obviously not something that's going to work for everyone back to context but um, I personally like that idea something we're going to work towards is a more field harvesting too so we you know say come June and you've got really young calves, you don't necessarily want to run your whole herd through the corrals to separate a bunch of those animals off. Whereas if you're, you know, if you've got a market for field harvested grass fed bison, you can, uh, you know, slowly but surely pick those animals out of the herd and not have to stress the entire group. Mm. So that's something we're working towards as well. Sure. Um, well, I'll go with this question for now. One of the interesting things about the uh, bison market, I guess, is that it, it doesn't seem to be uh, a lot of people are marketing genetics, uh, so to speak. A lot of people are kind of like you talked about, developing bulls from within their own herd. Is, is that an opportunity or is that just the way it is? Well, you do see it. You do see it in bison circles where, you know, it's kind of following that, um, that say purebred cattle mentality of, hmm. um, you know, developing the biggest animals and, you know, these big animals that win the shows and these <laughs> judging contests based off of, you know, being juiced up on grain and, you know, not actual real world performance out on the pasture and the elements. And so, um, there is, definitely is that subset of the bison industry, which is actually pretty big. And, um, but what to me, where there, there is real value is, uh, you know, animals that, you know, back kind of back to the Gabe Brown model of, of following nature, letting nature select those bison that do well with low inputs, striving for animals that are profitable instead of these, you know, animals that look good in the show ring. Um, in our, our herd, uh, up in Alberta, like we, you know, we've tried to follow the model of, of keep getting animals that fit our environment. You know, that's a pretty common theme these days mm -hmm. and bison already fit that model. <laughs> uh, and you know, in fact, we, in our herd up in Alberta, we purchased some animals, uh, that came from Elk Island national park that, uh, literally were captured from the wild of less than, hmm. you know, less than 50 miles from where our ranch is located. Hmm. And so, you know, that you want to talk about being adapted to that landscape, uh, you know, that's what we're striving for. And then, and then from there, they need to work within our system to, you know, produce viable offspring with minimal, minimal inputs. And so, you know, we're not, we're not looking for the, the best, you know, the biggest, best bulls out of that group. And, you know, it's, it's just what nature uh, what is working in nature and in our ranch system as well. So I think there's opportunity, there definitely is opportunity uh, in that realm, uh, developing low input bison herds, which, you know, they kind of already are. Uh, but at the same time, there also is a subset because there are plains bison and wood bison. So wood bison are native to Northern Canada up into Alaska and they're, they evolved in a boreal environment, so they're a little bit taller. Their head mm. uh, tends to sit at more of a mid-level as opposed to a plains bison that, you know, is completely adapted to grazing on the ground. <laughs> uh, wood bison are taller, so they're browsing trees a, lo a lot more. And a lot of people are taking wood bison, crossing them with plains bison, and getting a hybrid vigor. And that's kind of become a pretty common theme in the industry. And um, in my opinion, I'm not involved in any of that. I prefer to to keep plains bison, plains bison, and wood bison, wood bison. Mm. Kind of a reason in my mind that nature uh, evolved that way. And so, um, you know, that's that's a bit, that's a really big thing. Like uh, plains wood cross is something that people are marketing these days. Mm. 
So yep. uh, you'll appreciate this. When we were working these Buffalo on uh, last Wednesday, I I was thinking about stockmanship while I was in there and, and just trying to figure out what, what would work and what was different. And uh, I said to the guy that was working with me in the, in the crowding pen, I said, uh, you know, Kurt Pate said that a good stockman keeps the cow's head down. I'm like, these guys' heads always down. <laughs> so how do you tell? <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyways, I guess I did remember where I was going on that other question is, is there, do you expect that as you find animals that are adapted to their environment, that that first calving age will lower? Or is that, um, I mean, even, even in the, in the days of roaming bison herds, do you, is there evidence that they were calving at a later age? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that we probably, in an environment like Texas, which is, uh, I would say, not as optimal uh, bison environment than than the northern plains, I don't expect that we'll start to see yearlings being bred up. Um, back home, though, this this year, we had it. We did some preg checking, and our vet, you know, every, everyone was coming up pregnant, and we were. It was really exciting, and then the vet who was a his name's Pat Burridge. He's a experienced bison vet. You know, he was really impressed with the herd coming through, just their body condition. Everyone's coming up pregnant and he's like, Hey, well, why don't we, why don't we check a couple of these yearlings? They sure look good. And, and actually, uh, two of them came up bred, which is mm. something that I've never really heard of. And I'm sure it happens from time to time, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like it, we're, you kind of have to be, you got to be managing at a pretty optimal level to achieve that. And I don't know that on any sort of a scale, we'll be able to start breeding, breeding up bison as yearlings or, or, you know, I think there probably is a reason why nature uh, (laughs) makes them breed at two and a half years. And I don't know if that's the right goal or, or what. And so something to keep in mind uh, with bison is, you know, you're playing a bit of a longer game. Uh, One of the biggest, hidden costs in in any sort of a cow calf operation is that depreciation on the cow uh mm-hmm. bison they will calve uh consistently well into their 20s mm-hmm. and so um you know you can use a an average depending on the herd an average lifespan productive lifespan of that cow around 13 14 15 years old on average so you're, you know, you might, you might lose that year, that first year, uh, as a yearling not being bred up, but you're gaining, you know, you're gaining a couple, a couple years there on the tail end of just being able to retain that cow and have her, have her pay for herself over that, that longer period of time. Hmm. Yeah, very good. Really appreciate that. Well, I guess I want to give you an opportunity to share uh, any any tools or any links that you want uh, in the show notes page for today. Uh, I think today is going to be episode 132. Um, some of my bonus content that's going to come out of that trip to Canada that I took is going to is going to play with that a little bit. But we're gonna we're gonna go with 132 today for a show notes page, workingcows.net/132. So if there's any any products or uh, any links you want to share. I would love to love to put a link up there. Sure, yeah. Um, people can definitely follow what we're doing here uh, at Rome Ranch on Instagram. So at Rome Ranch, R-O-A-M, Ranch. And our website, RomeRanch.com. You can check out some cool stuff that we've got going on. Um, yeah, some of, the, some of the tools that we use here, here and, and in Alberta, uh, we work with a company called range ward range w a r d dot c a and that's a company that makes uh high quality electric fencing equipment for large scale rangelands so all in one uh fencing trailers have got a solar panel energizer battery and you can spool up anywhere from 2 miles to a half a mile of electric fence and so that works well on on large scale rangelands um, so we're we're constantly trying to innovate what works for us with our bison herd uh, as far as management tools. And so if people want to reach out to me to talk bison or, you know, to talk electric fencing or talk anything, uh, they can get a hold of me either at uh, my email is Cody at 
sweetgrassbison.ca or cody at roamranch.com. Either of those two I use. Okay. Appreciate that. And we'll definitely throw those links up there in the show notes page. One thing that I did have uh, that I, I forgot about is I've had a bunch of people from Texas or a few people from Texas email me and ask me to find somebody to talk about uh, different insect uh, challenges that are kind of unique to Texas. And I want to say one of them was an ant in particular. Do you have any any challenges with that or any way that you guys have, have uh, overcome that? Yeah, well, when it comes to ant, fire ants and ants here, they're definitely definitely a problem. I don't know that I've I've had any uh, death loss from fire ants, but they're definitely a concern for us. Um, I think that I think that just just like any other management issue you might have, uh, moving daily and long recovery periods do help with all of those things. Uh, maybe just not lingering around, like. Any time, if you've got an anthill, any the more time you're exposed to it, the more likely you are to to have problems that stem from that. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience with uh, struggling with that. But one thing we do struggle with is uh, in this wet environment, wet hot environment, is internal parasites, mm. and so that's what our uh, long longer striving for longer recovery periods. Uh, breaking the life cycle of those those internal parasites and uh, trying to trying to just beat those out and uh, so that that's been a new thing for me so up on the <laughs> northern plains you just don't really we've got those good killing winters that break up the life cycle and then the you know our short growing season isn't as conducive to high populations of parasites so that's that's one that uh, would be really good to get some get another expert on to talk about those challenges because you know the challenges of ranching in the southern plains or southeast is you know quite a bit different than than the north and i know that your listener base is pretty broad at Mm -hmm. this point yeah so i was sitting in a in a class in eastern oklahoma and uh pj kimmel uh is a guy who's doing some amazing things in northern montana extreme northern montana he's right up on the canadian border and he's doing cool things with cover crops and all kinds of stuff and he was sitting right in front of me and uh they were talking about fescue toxicity and about how uh if you graze it at the wrong time of the year or whatever i'm not sure exactly what the play is there but uh you know tails can fall off feet can fall off ears can fall off and i i tapped tapped pj on the shoulder and i said hey 12 inches of rain doesn't sound so bad anymore does it (laughs) (laughs) see it's got its its advantages and (laughs) um you you even i think you had a guest uh i forget his name it was about a month ago and you know he talked about being up in that country and uh looking around he was testing forage and you know he figured that 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 short grass country uh, pretty mm. hard scrabble country might not be <laughs> might, might not be a good place to to raise a cow but when he was testing those hard grasses those native grasses they they really pack a punch compared to you know really high rainfall big biomass but very washy and uh, you know serious lack of nutrient nutrient density in those grasses so everywhere has got their competitive advantage and <laughs> I guess it's all about harnessing that Yep. Yeah, that was Chuck Cosgrove on episode 124. Right. So, yeah, good stuff. Nice. Well, uh, Cody, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your patience with my challenges on the front end of this episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, all good, Clay. Thanks for having me. Very good episode with him. And uh, there's going to be some funny things going on with the show notes pages, as I mentioned them in the course of the episodes uh, over the next couple of weeks, just because of uh, different things getting shifted around and me not being able to keep them all straight. So next week, I'm going to be talking to Ariel Greenwood for episode 133 of the Working Cows podcast. And uh, I'm going to mention a couple of times in the course of that episode that it's 132. uh, But I'm not a skilled enough editor to change that. And I have a cold now, so my voice sounds different. So all of those things, uh, notwithstanding next week is episode 133 with Ariel Greenwood and, uh, look forward to getting that conversation out to you guys as well. So, uh, we will see you real soon with another episode of the working cows podcast. 
We invite you to visit WorkingCows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.